Gene editing can create some pretty cool things. It has allowed us the ability to feed our ever-growing population, we can get seedless fruit, and farmers who grow crops can douse all of our veggies and all the pesticides they want without killing the food. But sometimes, people can take things a little too far, and this is where stuff starts to get a bit dicey. Yeah, from Spider-Man goats to weirdly spicy tomatoes, all the way to poisonous cabbage. There's a lot going on in the gene engineering world, and some of it is so strange that we have gotten together, and now we have to talk through at least 10 of them. That's why on today's top 10 list, we are going to be diving into the top 10 disturbing things created by genetic engineering. What is up, top 10 fam? Welcome back. I am one of your hosts today, Olivia Kozlowski, and you might be wondering who this is. Who is this random tall guy standing? Well, not tall, because of the box. Who is this guy? <laughs> who am I? I'm Taylor McWaters. I'm from Top 10 Nerd and Life's Biggest Questions, and now I'm in this room. More curls are added to the mix. More curls. The curl kids are yeah. here. Taylor is our newest yeah. MA host. Give him the warm welcome. I know you yep. all well. Yep, I'm happy to be here and to talk about venomous cabbage. Let's do it, hot start. Let's get into it. Kicking off the list at number 10, Enviro Pig. The Enviro Pig was a transgenic pig developed in Canada at the University of Guelph. Home of the Griffins and the Frankenswine. Awesome, gotta love it. Welcome to Guelph. Scientists from South China's Agricultural University originally wrote a paper about the transgenic pig that can grow faster than normal and, on top of that, have less of an impact on the environment. Lovely. Live fast, little piggies. Now, normally these hogs would release a high percentage of nitrogen and phosphorus because, well, because they haven't evolved to digest those nutrients in their meals. These nutrients end up in their waste, which subsequently ends up in our lakes and rivers, and then in our mouths and eyes and nose. It would pollute the water with phosphorus, and that's when the Enviro Pig scuffles in to save the day. Scientists alter their DNA in order to produce more phytase, in order for Frankenswine to fully digest all the nutrients, instead of leaving us the crappy ones, pun intended. In our number nine spot today, we have web spinning goats. While many of us have dreamed of becoming Spider-Man, it turns out the only ones who get that luxury are goats. Researchers from the University of Wyoming have developed a way to incorporate a spider's silk spinning genes into goat's milk. This would then allow scientists to be able to harvest the silk proteins from the milk in order to use them. You might be wondering why, and that's a super valid question because it seems pretty random, but as it turns out, it actually might have some pretty exceptional uses. Spider silk is a super valuable naturally occurring material because it not only is strong, but it is flexible as well. These types of proteins can be used for medical things like making artificial ligaments and tendons or eye sutures, but it can also be used in other ways like to help build parachute cords or bulletproof vests somehow. Why didn't we just get that silk from the OG source? Well, you'd need a ton of spiders, and when you put a bunch of them together, they usually just kill each other, so... Naturally, goats were the next option. Are you tired of losing your pet rabbits every time there's a blackout? Well, fear no more. This horrific treatment may just solve that problem. Back in 2000, an artist by the name of Eduardo Kack created this glow-in-the-dark rabbit in collaboration with French geneticist Louis-Marie Hodenbein. It was referred to as the GFP bunny, and it was this cute little albino floof that would glow under any blue light. Now, this glowing gal is named Alba. And what Hodenbein did was take the GFP gene found in a jellyfish, a certain type called Aquora victoria, which which rhymes, which is always awesome, but it would glow green when exposed to blue light. Now, Alba was a one-of-a-kind experiment, and I used the word was with sorrow. Alba sadly passed away in 2002, but her death has brought up a few questions. A US reporter called experts in France, where Hodebein worked, and they were told that Alba had passed, but they didn't provide any substantial evidence onto how. No reason was given as to why this rabbit passed away. Now, you would think the world's first glowing rabbit would deserve more than, I don't know, maybe a voicemail to say, hey, it's dead, see ya. Maybe she's still alive. Maybe Hydra has are in some basement. Only time will tell. We'll see. In our number seven spot today, we have banana vaccines. Remember as a kid when you were sick and had to get medicine and it sucked, but then you found out it was the banana flavored kind and suddenly things weren't so bad? Well, this is absolutely nothing like that. Scientists have been able to successfully engineer different foods like bananas, lettuce, potatoes, and carrots to produce different vaccines, but apparently bananas are the most ideal candidate for this sort of thing. What's crazy is that with bananas, when an altered form of the the virus is injected into the banana sapling, it ends up acting almost exactly like a traditional vaccine. Not the mRNA one that we're becoming familiar with with the pandemic, but the kind used for things like hepatitis and cholera. This is because once the banana sapling is injected, the virus's genetic material then becomes a permanent part of the plant's cells. From here, as the bananas grow, the cells of it produce the virus proteins, but not the infectious part of the virus that makes you sick. So your body can now learn these proteins and then build up the antibodies needed 
in order to fight it. Honestly, this one seems a little weird on the surface, but I am all for the idea of vaccines one day not being given through needles. I don't like bananas either though, so guess I'm shit out of luck. Number six, spicy tomatoes. Picture this, you're at a barbecue, you're eating burgers with your peers, you're having a great time, and then somebody next to you starts coughing and you ask if they're okay, and they're like, oh, I'm fine, it's just, this tomato is just oh so spicy. Huh? Yeah, spicy tomatoes, they're a thing, let's talk about it. Scientists in Brazil and Ireland have cracked the condiment code, or so they thought. Using CRISPR, they created the first ever tomato that is naturally <sighs> spicy. The trick is in its DNA. Tomatoes already carry the appropriate genes to produce capsaicin, which is the same ingredient that makes your mouth burn every time you eat a hot chili pepper. Some are on board with the spicy tomato, dare I say they're even excited to use this for some Saturday spicy salsa. Honestly, I'm all set for this. I eat a junior chicken, and I'm like, oh, can I get a glass of milk? I'm way, I'm not good with spice at all. It's all fun and games until a Greek salad lights up your lips. In our number five spot today, we have DIY CRISPR Cas9 kits. If you haven't heard of the controversial Josiah Zayner, he is the eccentric biochemist who is the owner of a startup company called The Odin. Josiah is no stranger to the world of genetic engineering, and in fact, he has done some experiments on himself when he injected himself with modified cells to become more muscular. He did this by removing the gene for myostatin, and without this gene, muscles keep growing. Regardless of this interesting experiment, what I really want to talk about is how the Odin has released CRISPR-Cas9 kits that allow you to experiment with genetic modifications yourself. I'm sure this is probably harmless, but it just seems like this kind of power should stay in the hands of those who know exactly what they're doing. Maybe that's just the skeptic in me, but there's something about a DIY genetic modification kit made by a guy who tried to modify his own muscles that just seems a little weird. No judgment, just not my personal cup of tea. Number four, salmon. This photo shows a genetically engineered salmon next to farmed Atlantic salmon. They're both the same age, they're both 18 months old, but the one in the back looks like it's been bench pressing for nine months. It's clearly much larger, and that's because Aqua Bounty's genetically modified salmon grows at double the speed. No more fake IDs for those salmon, they're getting in quick. Canadian scientists took the gene that regulates these growth hormones from salmon, combined it with an ocean pout's DNA, and now we have the ability to simply grow these fish up a few years. Now the taste is the same. In fact, apparently it's even better. This modification gives the Atlantic salmon a fresh taste all year round. The same company that I mentioned earlier, Aqua Bounty, also plans on using these fish to mass produce eggs at its research hatchery in PEI. They then want to ship these eggs to Panama where they'll grow again twice as fast, but this time in a land-based facility where they'll wait approval by the FDA. The thing is, neither Canada or the US has done nearly enough safety trials. It's just Aqua Bounty. So we really don't know any long-term effects that this will have on us or the ecosystem. System. We can't have nine foot salmon swimming up our rivers every day. That, that's a bit, it's a bit alarming, I think. In our number three spot today, we have Dolly the Sheep. You may have heard of Dolly the Sheep before, and that is because she made history in 1996 when she was born. This is because she was the very first mammal to be cloned from an adult somatic cell. The process of cloning to create her involved nuclear transfer from a cell taken from the mammary gland. Basically, they transferred the nucleus from the adult cell into an unfertilized premature egg that had its nucleus removed and boom, cloned sheep. This was huge for the scientific community because of the fact that it not only showed that cloning can be successful in mammals, but also because it showed that a clone organism can be produced from a mature cell from a specific body part. While Dolly made history, she also sadly only lived a relatively short life. She ended up being euthanized just before her seventh birthday because of the fact that she had a progressive lung disease, as well as arthritis, both of which are said to not be linked to her cloning origins. I guess it's kind of cool that Dolly exists Existed, and the fact that we have these scientific abilities is amazing, but there's also something pretty ominous about it. I just hope we use these powers to do something like bringing back extinct animals rather than just some weird mad scientist type stuff. And in at number two, venomous cabbage. As if cabbage wasn't already not appealing, we've now thrown venom into the mix. Lovely. Venomous cabbage, why do we need this? Well, it starts with scorpion venom. It's one of their most vital tools when it comes to self-defense, obviously. So taking that gene and combining it with cabbage could limit our use of pesticides, but at the same time, still prevent those fat caterpillars from harming our crops. Hey, if you have a caterpillar problem, just poison them. There you go, guys. Sounds appetizing too. The cabbage would then naturally produce this scorpion poison. So if any pest came along looking to have a work lunch, they would be long gone before they could even leave a Yelp review. Poor little dudes. In our number one spot today, we have CRISPR babies. This is probably the most well-known case of human genetic engineering and probably not for the right reasons. On November 25th, 2018, He Jian Ki, who is a biophysics researcher announced
announced here on YouTube that his team had successfully created the world's first genome edited babies. These babies, Lulu and Nana, were born from genetically modified embryos that had been made to be resistant to HIV. Here's the thing no one is arguing about whether or not this could potentially be an amazing thing for people. The argument is about whether or not it is ethically correct to genetically modify a human before they're even able to be a human yet, especially when the potential risks and long term effects of this kind were completely unknown. This study was also conducted without the public discussion of the scientific community, which again is the source of quite a bit of controversy. In the end, he ended up being sentenced to jail time as well as being forced to pay a fine. Two others he worked alongside were also found guilty for having, quote, forged ethical review documents and misled doctors into unknowingly implanting gene edited embryos into two women. At the end of the day, scientific advancements are very cool and exciting, but not at the cost of doing the right thing the right way. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Those were just 10 disturbing things created by genetic engineering. And if for some reason a part two is in your deepest desires, hit that thumbs up, show some love, and let us know in the comment section down below. I've been one of your hosts today, Olivia Kozlowski. I've been Taylor McWaters. Thanks for having me on the channel. I can't wait, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <gasps> First collab. This is wild. Wait, one We're recording. Okay. Sorry, editor. They're like, they're like, take your photo. They're like, awesome. <laughs> like, looking good, guys. I have a job. We're the curl kids. <clears throat> curl kids? Oh, I love that. And farmers who grow crops can dose all of our. And farmers who grow. Co <laughs> grow cops. <laughs> Ooh, I didn't bring any water. I'm gonna be dry mouth boy today. Explain <coughs> my goats are always on the roof. <laughs> Wait, how'd they get up there? I climbed. No, I know. Number eight. <laughs> Number four. Salmon. <laughs> oh fuck. Salmon. I think that's how you say that. On November 25th, 2018. Oh, Chris, how do you say this name? Give it a whirl. And I've been Taylor McWaters. Thank you for welcoming me. See ya. Yeah, what? <laughs> Bye. Yeah, I'm like, see ya.